I'd like you to turn to Luke, um, chapter 24. And the title for our message tonight is Finding Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, it's especially about can we find types in the Old Testament uh, in addition to those that Christ and the apostles found. Can we reproduce, in other words, the interpretive method of, the, of Jesus and the um, apostles? Uh, they interpreted typologically, can we? And so what I'm going to try to propose are uh, some ways of um, safeguarding wild typological interpretation, because the history of the church is about not only wild allegorical interpretation, but wild typological interpretation, uh, finding types where they really aren't, and it ends up being close to allegorical interpretation. Allegory means reading in another meaning than was originally intended. So <clears throat> let's read our passage in, um, in this uh, text, Luke chapter 24 and verse Twenty-five. Jesus says, uh, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. <clears throat> Was it not necessary for the Messiah, Christ, to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what we're going to look at this evening, and we're going to come back to this passage, and uh, there's a debate about this passage. Um, some think that Christ is only, you can only find him in the direct verbal prophecies of the Old Testament. Um, others think that you can find Christ in every verse of the Old Testament. Uh, and, and actually, there are good scholars on both sides. So we'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> but what I'm mainly going to be looking at is a, a kind of a Christocentric and Christotelic understanding of the Old Testament. Christotelic means the Old Testament has its goal in Christ. How can we read the Old Testament that way? Christocentric is that Christ is centrally involved in the passages of the Old Testament. How can we read them in that way without reading Christ in in a wrong way where he's not? So um, let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we do thank you that uh, you're the Lord God of heaven and earth. We do pray that you'll Help us, uh, give us endurance here at this late hour, and to uh, re rejuvenate our minds, to uh, uh, understand your word. And uh, we pray that we would uh, see how Christ interprets the scriptures and that we would interpret likewise. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, <clears throat> the relation of the Old Testament to the New not only has been an area of debate between evangelicals and non-evangelicals, but as I have uh, suggested, uh, it's a debate among uh, evangelicals themselves. Um, the issue is whether or not Jesus and the New Testament writers interpreted passages in line with their original meaning in the Old Testament. Some scholars, and again, including some evangelical scholars, argue that Jesus and the New Testament writers found Christ in Old Testament passages where the Old Testament writer never meant to include Christ. So they read Christ in wrongly. <clears throat> so, um, uh, and yet, uh, those same evangelical scholars would say they were still inspired in doing so. Uh, very interesting. There are numerous examples where scholars view the New Testament writers to be reading in Christ. The Old Testament passages that originally had nothing to do with him um, though other passages could be cited, a classic example is Matthew's use of Hosea 11.1, 1, cited in Matthew 2.15, <clears throat> where Jesus is told to, uh, Joseph is told to take the Holy Family into Egypt, and so he does. And um, as they enter in, it says, and this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet out of Egypt have I called my son. <clears throat> and so um, this uh, verse in Hosea um, 
is very difficult. In fact, some have seen three difficulties with it. In fact, this verse, this use of Hosea 11.1 1 in Matthew 2.15 uh, has caused some evangelicals to even leave, leave their belief in inerrancy. How can you believe in inerrancy and, and believe that Matthew could use Scripture in such a uh, haphazard way? And there are three problems, so not just one problem. One is how can you make a historical text out of Egypt that I call my son, that's about Israel bringing, God bringing Israel out of Egypt, how can you make that into a prophecy? Because that's what the text says in, in, in Matthew 2.15, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. I, even uh, students in uh, uh, Bible 101 would know not to make a historical narrative into a prophecy. Um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is <clears throat> that when uh, the Holy Family enters Egypt, it says that fulfills the prophecy, out of Egypt have I called my son. But they don't come out of Egypt until about four or five verses later. Why not quote it there when they come out of Egypt? Why quote it when they're going into Egypt? Seems again a little haphazard. And then finally, how can you apply what's true of the nation? Out of Egypt I call my son, that's the nation Israel, right? Matthew applies that to Jesus, one individual. How can you apply what's true of a nation to only one individual? So those are the problems with that text. We're going to address those problems a little bit later. But um, in view of these problems, there have been a variety of responses. One evangelical reform commentator said that this passage, the use of Hosea 11.1 1 and Matthew 2, um, is a quote great example of the manner in which the New Testament uses the Old, especially uh, in the New Testament writers not being interested in reproducing the meaning of the Old Testament, but in reading in Old Testament foreign Christological presuppositions. Another evangelical commentator said, this is the most troubling case of New Testament interpretation of the Old for many people, this use of Hosea. So, <clears throat> we look at our text, we find that a number of commentators have had problems with the, the New Testament use of the old. Morna Hooker is one such scholar. Uh, she would not claim to be an evangelical. Um, she held the Lady Margaret Chair of Divinity for many years at the University of Cambridge. Um, and I, I think she would consider herself a, a Christian. Uh, that's my guess. But as, as we look at uh, what she says, notice what she says here. Um, <clears throat> any New Testament scholar who is in any way interested in the problem of hermeneutics is well aware uh, of the dichotomy between the approach of the New Testament authors to Scripture and our own approach. So we approach Scripture differently than the New Testament writers did. And for her, we know how to approach Scripture. We're more scientific. New Testament writers, well, they were part of a Jewish age where uh, they weren't so careful with the Bible. Now she continues, a study of their methods of exegesis must surely make any 20th century preacher uncomfortable, for they tear passages out of context, use allegory or typology to give Old Testament stories new meanings to contradict the plain meaning of the text. So uh, she's not alone. Many um, scholars, and again, some evangelical scholars could say this. The difference between them and her is they would say, well, this wrong interpretation by the New Testament writers inspired. Even though it's a wrong interpretation, the doctrine, the doctrine, that's inspired. And so she continues, the New Testament writers find references to Christ in passages where the original author certainly never intended any and adapt or even alter the wording in order to make it yield the meaning they require. Often one is left exclaiming, whatever the passage from the Old Testament meant originally, it certainly was not this that Jesus or the New Testament writer says it is. Although Paul may frequently quote from Scripture, the interpretation he gives often lies beyond the obvious meaning of the text. His somewhat artificial exegesis or interpretation 
leaves one wondering whether there is anything which it would not be possible for him to argue uh, on the basis of Scripture. He could take any Scripture, regardless of its meaning, and make it uh, mean what he wants it to mean. So, um, so she's not the only one. She is just representative of uh, what scholars think. And again, this, this, is not just, this is not just what I call um, an outhouse debate. That is a debate between uh, uh, conservative evangelicals and, uh, and liberals. It's an in-house debate as well. I've said that repeatedly, and it is true. In fact, Westminster Seminary uh, almost uh, was divided over this issue uh, in about t 2007. And uh, most of the people in the biblical studies department believed that the New Testament writers preached the right doctrine, but from the wrong text. And, uh, but, the, but they were inspired because the doctrine was right. And um, that was a huge watershed moment. Was Westminster going to go the way of all other seminaries that had become liberal? And um, eventually, uh, it didn't go that way. Uh, those professors eventually left, and others came in to fill their place who were uh, orthodox. So, uh, what we find then is that when we look at this Luke 24, 27 passage, where it says that Christ spoke of himself from all the scriptures, um, we want to find out what does that mean. And, and so we're going to do a, we're going to take a long trail, and then we're going to address that passage again at the end of the message. So the purpose of this message this evening is to present an approach that justifies seeing Christ in all of Scripture in a way that develops the original meaning of the Old Testament and does not wrongly read in Christ into Old Testament passages. So, first of all then, um, there are interpretive approaches uh, viewing Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, a, a number of those um, are, are very simple, easy to understand. For example, a first approach would be, clearly there are direct prophecies about Christ from the Old Testament that are quoted in the New. And Dr. Glad talked about those. That's seen as direct fulfillment of prophecy. So we have plenty of those. Um, but the question is, is it, or is it only those direct prophecies about the Messiah quoted in the New? Is that it? Nothing else? Because um, uh, while there are those prophecies, they're limited. And so uh, if that's all there is, uh, it's going to be tough to preach Christ from the whole Old Testament. You can only preach him from those particular uh, direct prophecies about the Messiah. Uh, Dr. Glad mentioned, uh, remember uh, Luke 4, where Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to preach uh, restoration from captivity. And then Jesus says, today the Scripture's fulfilled in your hearing. It's begun fulfillment, yet to be consummated, but it's begun fulfillment. That's a good example of uh, the beginning, uh, a direct messianic uh, prophecy fulfilled uh, in a beginning way in the New Testament. But besides direct prophecies of Christ, remember the second major category of um, uh, references to Christ uh, was indirect typological um, prophecy or typology. My wife likes to call it event prophecy where events involving people or institutions foreshadow what's going to happen in the New Testament. Um, certainly we have analogy, but uh, typology takes up within itself not only analogy, but it has a what I call a pointing forwardness to it. And um, many would qualify this by saying that the Old Testament author has no awareness of any foreshadowing sense. The full divine intention um, did include the foreshadowing in the sense, but the, the Old Testament author had no idea what, of what was going on. And in fact, some would even view 
uh, the New Testament typological interpretation to be uh, uh, reading in a new idea into the Old Testament, reading in prophecy where it's not. It's just an event. Um, and so what we want to do, we want to look at a definition of typology that includes both analogy and a prophetic element. And so we're going to start again with the definition of typology. It's a study of analogical correspondences between persons, events, and situations, and other things within the historical framework of God's special revelation, which from a retrospective view are of a prophetic nature. So there are five elements we could reduce that down to. Five elements that are crucial to have typology or event prophecy. Analogy, historicity, a forward pointingness, escalation, and retrospection. Remember escalation? Uh, in John 19, Jesus is said to be the fulfillment of the Passover lamb from Exodus 12. Um, well, I'd say he's a little more escalated than the lamb. That's a good example. You go from an animal to Jesus Christ. That's escalation. Now, remember that uh, retrospection means that these things could only be seen after the coming of uh, Christ's resurrection and the coming of the Spirit. It's only after that that the apostles can look back and say, ah, now I see that. But I'm going to contend, as I already contended with uh, the use of Isaiah 22, 22 in uh, Revelation 3, 7, I'm going to contend that New Te New Old Testament writers were more often than we think aware. They provide hints for us to show that they had some degree of awareness that what they were narrating, that whatever event it was, had some foreshadowing element to it beyond that of um, the event they were narrating. We actually saw that, didn't we, with Eliakim, right? And um, I'll remind you of that again. And so um, while retrospection is true, I would say that what that means is that we can see this type more clearly than Old Testament writers themselves would have seen it. Not that they didn't see it at all. So, um, so uh, we're going to look at criteria for types of Christ. A lot of our time tonight is going to delve in to looking at typology, okay? And especially... These criteria that we're going to look at, criteria for types of Christ, the, the, this also could be explained as ways to curb your wild typological appetite. In other words, ways to curb uh, not reading Christ into passages where you shouldn't read him into. Okay? So um, let's look at this. And what I'm going to do... I'm going to lay these criteria out first. Uh, there are eight criteria, A through H. And I'm going to lay them out. <clears throat> then we're going to take, take each one and go back and uh, explain it and look at it. So first of all, uh, let's say, what are these criteria? Well, one, are all five elements of typology present that we just looked at? You've got to have that. That's a presupposition, too. Does the New Testament text use the word tupos or a particular fulfillment formula? In other words, remember what uh, Hosea 11, 1 and Matthew 2, 15 said. Uh, Joseph takes a holy family into Egypt and it says this was to fulfill. Fulfill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Hosea out of Egypt I call my son. But that's just a historical text. It's about God calling Israel out of Egypt as a nation. Matthew sees it as a prophecy. How can you do that? Well, we're going to see. Um, and then, but, but if you have a fulfillment formula that is prefixed to some historical event, you know that that historical event is a prophecy, regardless of whether you fully understand it. So if you have you know, synonymous phrases with fulfillment, other kinds of indications of fulfillment, you know 
that that event is being seen um, as a foreshadowing event that's fulfilled in the new. Uh, third, is there some typological anticipation evident in the immediate Old Testament context? So we'll see what that means, okay? Not going to unfold it now. Um, but there may be hints in the immediate context of typology. Four, if the context of the Old Testament passage does not indicate typological anticipation, are there indications in its wider Old Testament context? Maybe in the book, maybe later in the Old Testament. Again, I want to mention here a book by a guy by the name of Gary Schnicker. Uh, let me spell that for you because it's, it's, it's very strange in my, in my view. No, it's not to him. He's had the name his whole life. But it's S-C-H-N-I-T-T-J-E-R. He's written a book called The Old and the Old. And uh, that shows a lot of the types in the Old Testament that foreshadow later fulfillments within the Old Testament itself. So he talks a lot about this and, and shows that how uh, later Old Testament texts will show the earlier Old, Old Testament texts had a foreshadowing sense. But you, that's the wider canonical uh, Old Testament context. Again, his book is uh, 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 Use of the Old Testament in the Old. And uh, that last J-E-R of his name is pronounced Gur. I just evaluated his book on a panel last year. And before we had the panel, all of the panelists uh, had to write him and say, please tell us how to pronounce your name. So we did. We got it right. So um, then... Here's another criteria. Fifth, are there literary clusters of repeated commissions? Remember, I call this the phone rod principle. Remember Gerhardt's phone rod? is volume two, where you have these clusters, commission failure, commission failure, as in the judges, commission failure. Why do you have that? Well, it's to show that the lack points forward. So we'll look at that again. Um, uh, are Old Testament characters styled according to the pattern of earlier types of Christ? This is a really interesting one. If you can find characters that are clearly types of Christ, say Adam, and if you could find characters later in Genesis that are styled after Adam, then they probably also are good candidates for being types of Christ, as was Adam. So what I'm beginning to explain now, just by this uh, uh, reference here and, uh, and this one here, how can you interpret uh, parts of the Old Testament as typological that the New Testament writers didn't? These two criteria are at least two that you can do that by. So, I mean, this is really important. And you're preaching. You're teaching. You're in the Old Testament. Uh, these are some criteria you can use for seeing something as typological and not reading it in wrongly. So then, next, are there partially fulfilled prophecies pointing to a more complete fulfillment? So there's a prophecy in the Old Testament. It begins to be fulfilled in the Old, but not completely. So it awaits a further fulfillment. We'll see an example of that. And finally, are there repeating patterns of redemptive historical events? And we'll talk about what I mean by that. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's start with the, um, the first criteria, um, and that is uh, the five elements of typology have to be included to have a type. That's pretty basic, and we don't need to do much there. You have to have historicity, analogy, a forward-pointingness, escalation, and some degree of retrospection. And um, so one example of this is when Matthew understands that Joseph taking of Jesus into Egypt and back out again is a fulfillment of Israel's um, past journey into Egypt. And, um, and so what we're, what we're looking at then um, 
We're going to uh, look at that in just a second. Let me go to the, uh, the next one here. The next one's pretty basic, too. I keep punching my uh, pointer. So the second one is, does the, Old Test does the New Testament reference contain the word uh, tupos, which is the word type? Um, do does its immediate context contain a fulfillment formula, that it might be fulfilled? We, we talked about that. Or the language of it is necessary. That's the language of prophetic necessity, that the Son of Man, for example, must be lifted up. So these are pretty simple. When you see fulfillment language or synonymous language, it's like fulfillment. Yeah, you've got an event that is seen as a foreshadowing event. Um, but <clears throat> coming back then to uh, C, is there evidence of typological anticipation in the immediate context of some Old Testament passages? And this is where, again, we need to look at Matthew. Because, first of all, remember there were three problems with Matthew? Uh, how could you make a prophecy out of an event? Number two, how could you quote it when they're entering in instead of coming back out? And number three, how can you apply uh, what's true of a nation to an individual? And so um, we're, we're going to see that what Matthew was doing, in fact, is something that is rooted in the Old Testament itself. Um, for example... The main goal of Hosea 11.1, 1, uh, it starts out in chapter 11, out of Egypt I call my son. Verse 5 says, and Israel will return to Egypt. And then verse 11 says, and Israel will come back out of Egypt. And so already in chapter 11, you've got out of Egypt, back into Egypt, and then out of Egypt again. In fact, the main point of chapter 11, it's all heading, beginning in, in verse 1, it's all heading to the climax of what? There's going to be an end time exodus. That's what verse 11 says. In the future, there will be another time when Israel uh, comes back out of Egypt. Uh, in the future. And so, already we see, hey, wait a minute, this idea of, uh, verse 1, out of Egypt I call my son, is really heading toward uh, Israel returning to Egypt, and especially Israel coming out of Egypt again. So that you could see in Hosea's own mind that inextricably linked to the nation coming out of Egypt in verse 1 is uh, Israel coming out of Egypt again in the future. They are linked. They're not unlinked in this passage. So, um, uh, the mention of a first exodus, and this is very interesting. Not only is it in chapter 11 where you get a first exodus, a return, and then a last exodus, but throughout the book of Hosea, this is very important, throughout the whole book of Hosea, you get references to the first exodus and to a last exodus. Let me show you some of the um, examples of that. So, you can see here on the left column that these are references in the book of Hosea to a first exodus. Hosea 2.15, she'll sing there the days of her youth as the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Okay? Other references to a first exodus. But you also get references to an end time reference. And uh, actually included in that is Israel will return in the future, and they'll come back out. Notice some of the language. Uh, Ephraim, being Israel, has become like a silly dove. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. So they're, they're, they're wanting to find Egypt to be uh, their refuge. And um, in chapter uh, 8, verse 13, now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt. 9.3, they will not remain in the Lord's land, but they will return to to Egypt. And again, on the right-hand column, um, uh, find that uh, Egypt will gather them up. They'll go there. Um, and then, of course, uh, chapter 1 and verse 11, 
It says, and they will go up from the land, and it's very clear, the land of Egypt. That's yet the future. That's a future exodus that they're going to experience. And then, of course, we got 11.5. Um, Israel is surely returned to the land of Egypt. And 11.11, here's your 11.11. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt in the future. Now, if you have a Bible and it says, uh, and you're looking at uh, Hosea 11.5, some texts say they will not return to Egypt. And um, I, I can't go into why I prefer the textual reading. They will return to Egypt. But again, I'm embarrassed to say I have a full article published in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society covering this message and actually why uh, this uh, verse 5 should read they will return to Egypt. I don't want to get bogged down in the mire of textual criticism here tonight. So, um, it could, in fact, be a rhetorical question. Will they return to Egypt? The answer being yes, they will. And so, here's the point. In Hosea, we have references to a first exodus, repeatedly. And we have repeated references to returning to Egypt and coming back out. Now, if you ask Hosea, Hosea, are, is, is the first exodus similar to this last exodus? He was a, of course. But here's the next question. Hosea, do you believe God is sovereign? Is it, yeah, of course. Do you believe God has sovereignly designed history so that the earlier parts are made to resemble the latter parts? Now, it's dangerous to put answers in a prophet's tongue who is not here, but I think he would say yes. Yeah. Are the similarities intended so that the earlier are designed to point to the latter? I think it would say yes. What we have here is Hosea himself affirming the first exodus, affirming a latter day exodus, and he sees probably that the first exodus is a pointer to a second exodus. And all Matthew is doing is Matthew making a prophecy uh, out of a historical recollection? No. He's seeing that the first exodus, just like Hosea did in the book, he's seeing that the first exodus is a pointer to a later exodus. He's using Hosea's own typological method. It's amazing. He's learning his method from Hosea. And that's why he sees what he does. And by the way, notice that some of these passages say, He'll return. They will return. That's why you have... Remember the second problem was, why would you apply the Hosea prophecy being fulfilled to them entering into Egypt? Why not when they come back out a few verses later? Because part of the complex of the prophecy is not just that they'll come back out of Egypt, they're going to enter in. So, um, Hosea is aware of that too. These people were not stupid. They knew their Bibles so much better than we and so-called modern scholars know their Bibles. After all, they had a pretty good teacher, Jesus Christ. Now, how about that problem that we looked at? How can you take what's true of a nation, Hosea 11, and apply that to an individual like Jesus? Well, we find, first of all, that in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, I think we have it, they will go up from the land of Egypt. Now, that's an important verse in Hosea, and I want to read the whole thing that says there in Hosea chapter 1, verse 11, the sons of Judah, the sons of Israel, will be gathered together. They'll appoint for themselves one head, a leader, and they'll go up from the land of Egypt. They'll uh, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And so I think that the idea, they have this one leader, this one head, it's called, uh, that will lead them, and so they're identified with that one head. I think probably you have the idea of the one and the many here. Um, and to substantiate that, some years ago I heard a very good um, message given at the Gordon-Conwell Chapel by uh, one of my colleagues who was just joining the faculty by the name of Dwayne Garrett. He now teaches Old Testament at Southern Seminary. And um, he said this, 
He said, if you study the use of the Old Testament in Hosea, here we go again, old and the old, that can help us. If you study it, what you find is individuals from Genesis are taken and applied to the nation. Let me give you an example. Uh, you have, for example, um, Adam. Remember uh, Hosea 6, 7? It says, like Adam, you've transgressed the covenant. And so you can take negative things about an individual and apply them to the nation. Likewise, uh, in uh, Hosea 12, 2 to 5, something very negative about Jacob is applied to the nation. But you get positive things too. For example, in, um, in Genesis, to Jacob the promise is made to make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered because of multitude. And now in Hosea, this is applied and reapplied to the nation Israel. So it's made to an individual. Now to Israel. It says, yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered or measured. And similarly, the, the valley of Achor, where Achan uh, and his family were taken to be executed for his sin, is taken by Hosea and reversed to indicate that God would reverse Israel's judgment of defeat and exile, and they would not be exterminated for her sin. And we could go on and on. It's a, it's a, a marvelous essay showing how the Old Testament Genesis is used in Hosea and how individuals from Genesis are taken, and what's true of them is now seen to be true of the nation, whether negatively, whether positively. That's what we call uh, an interpretive approach of the one and the many, of corporate representation. The one represents the many. And uh, what's Matthew doing? He takes what's true of the nation and applies it to an individual, that is Jesus. All he's doing is using the same interpretive approach but whereas Hosea went from the one to the many, Matthew's moving from the many back to the one. It's the same kind of approach uh, of the one and the many, uh, that one represents the many. What's true of the one is true of the many. And so uh, you go to Hosea and all these problems just vanish. And Hosea shows us that as Matthew summarizes him. Now, even when um, the immediate context of a passage does not indicate something's being viewed typologically, the wider canonical context, maybe the context of the wider book or the wider canonical context, uh, uh, usually provides hints or indications that the passage is typological. Now, we've already been given an example of that. We looked at that in uh, Isaiah 22, 22. And so, remember this? Um, this, is, this is beautiful. What this shows is that Isaiah did, in fact, he had some awareness that his narrative depiction of Eliakim was a foreshadowing event. So notice, the language of Isaiah 9 of the shoulders, the father, the throne of David, some of the synonyms of government, uh, as well as here, father, David, shoulder, throne, father's house. Um, here, Eliakim is being painted as the messianic child to come, the messianic figure to come. But he falls, doesn't he? He falls. And so it's not him, but do you not think that... Uh, Isaiah was aware that he was using that language to paint Eliakim with? Of course he was. He wouldn't have forgot chapter 9, where it occurs. Of course he was. He's painting Eliakim as a messianic-like figure. Is he going to succeed? Let's wait and see. Ah, no, he falls. And so, somebody's got to fulfill that prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9. But this is a good example of going all the way back to chapter 9 to see that in chapter 22, the narration about Eliakim does have foresha a foreshadowing nature. So these are ways to see that this is the case. It's not reading in uh, from the Old Testament. Um, and then um, 
we could look at uh, passages um, in which there are wider uh, places where um, you can go elsewhere in the Old Testament and find out what we saw in chapter 9, 22. You can find out where other passages in the Old Testament will allude uh, uh, to an earlier passage and see it as typological. And then sometimes a New Testament writer will take that very event as a foreshadowing event because it was already seen that way in the Old Testament. Um, I'm going to skip a few things here. Yeah, let's go to the, um, the criterion we've already seen. In some of this, we're building on the shoulders of what we've already done earlier today. So, are there literary clusters of repeated commissions, as we find with prophets, priests, and kings? Remember? This was the Fawad principle I'm talking about. And uh, I'm going to summarize it since we have looked at that in depth in Isaiah 22. So, when you add these commissions, speedy failure, commissions, speedy failure, that is a historical technique by the historical biblical writer to say, pay attention to the lack. It must be filled. And so, um, and, and there were other Old Testament pa passages about the Messiah that people would have been aware of who would have fulfilled that. This is really an important one. When you're preaching, let's say you're preaching judges, or you're preaching in kings where you have commission failure, commission failure. Uh, you can preach those Christologically. How? Because of the lack. The repeated cl clusters and cycles of commission failure, commission failure, that is the lack that's pointing forward. And uh, you can legitimately say that was the intention of the historical writer. So um, uh, you can read again the quotation of Von Rod. It's a marvelous quotation. I'm just going to, I'm summarizing him uh, again here. Um, and he's, that's his full quotation. In fact, I want to reverse. Remember this guy's not an evangelical. Listen to what he says here. Look at the end. This can be said quite categorically. The coming of Jesus Christ as a historical reality leaves the exegete no choice at all. He must interpret the Old Testament as pointing to Christ, whom he must understand in this light. Wow. Well, that's German dogmatism, but I think he's correct. And, and for not evangelical to say that, this just takes my breath away. Uh, in, in contrast to what we saw with Morna Hooker, uh, the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity. And so um, this is uh, uh, really crucial material here. Um, it reminds me, and I, I was going to share this later, but I'll, I'll share it now. I got convicted. Uh, somebody came up to me after I preached a sermon, and it was the use of Isaiah 6 in the New Testament. I felt like I'd talked about Christ enough in that, but this particular pastor didn't think so. And, and he spoke generally. He said, you know, if we're interpreting a passage in the Old Testament, and we do a great job of interpreting that passage, interpreting that paragraph uh, in its context in that chapter, uh, we do a very good job. And we conclude the sermon by... Uh, and you need to believe that Jesus died and rose again. Uh, well, that's fine to say that, but that's not what that text was about. You, you probably, you know, one could draw some principles uh, out of this exegesis, but what's the difference between doing that and a rabbi who's a very good interpreter? And the rabbi interprets the very same text and exegetes it just like you do as an evangelical. And then... Um, draws the same principles of application for a synagogue. Uh, what's the difference? Wow, that's convicting. We better learn how to interpret the Old Testament Christologically. We better learn how, whenever we're in an Old Testament text, we need to learn how organically to see 
How is this text in some way legitimately connected to the coming of the Messiah and to the New Testament? If we don't, we're rabbis. We're just interpreting the text like rabbis. I was taught that way originally when I learned uh, Hebrew. Um, and so, um, what we have then after the phone rod principle, uh, we have other criteria, and this is a real interesting one too. So it's the phone rod one. Wow, you can go all over the Old Testament with the phone rod principle. These speedy commissions and failures, it's all over the place. And I think we can legitimately say that the repeated lack is pointing forward. Legitimately say that. Um, so, uh, as we look at this, uh, the, well, let's elaborate on this. Our Old Testament characters styled according to the pattern of earlier Old Testament characters reviewed as types of Christ in the New Testament. In other words, if there's a clear Old Testament figure, that's a type in the Old Testament, let's say Adam. And other figures, let's say in Genesis, are styled after him. They look like him. Even though they're not said to be types of Christ, I think that they're good candidates for types of Christ. So realize that when you're preaching or teaching. Let's look at an example. Um, so here we have a comparison of the first world to the second world. Here's the second world. Let's look at the first world. A friend of mine did this chart, oh my gosh, so many years ago, I couldn't say. His name is Warren Austin Gage, and I, I think it's a very good chart here. And so, um, as we look at this, <clears throat> notice that there's the first world, that's what this is. The next chart is the second world, okay? And notice that in the first world, and you can see the parallels. In fact, you can see that the second world is modeled on the first world. In fact, I think we can go on to say that the first world was a typological interpretation, or it is a foreshadowing of the second world. Let's look at the parallels quickly. Waters cover the earth, spirit hovers, dry land, old world finished. First man commissioned to fill. Uh, animals uh, are there for Adam to name. Adam's sin in the garden, takes the fruit, naked and ashamed, naked and is covered, seed cursed. Uh, Cain pounds the wicked city of Enoch. Seth calls on the name of the Lord. Sons of God are enticed by daughters of men. Days of Noah come on the earth, brings a cloud, and you have a definitive end. This is important. A definitive end of the first world. So you can see the parallels with the second world. Notice, floodwaters cover the earth, dove hovers, emergence of dry land, present world finished, uh, man recommissioned, new command to fill the earth, animals uh, uh, are there for Noah to save, uh, Noah sends in the vineyard, takes the fruit of the vine, he's naked and ashamed, uh, nakedness covered, seed cursed, and, and then we get uh, the two uh, seeds. Uh, and notice what happens here. The end of the second world you have, according to Jesus, that the days of Noah will be on the earth again. Remember, they'll be marrying and giving in marriage. You remember that. God comes in clouds to destroy with a fire. The present heavens and earth must pass away. But they haven't passed away. That is not a description. That's what's going to happen in the future. I would contend, why did Jesus and the apostles believe that the days of Noah be, would be on the earth again, that there would be a universal destruction. I think part of the reason is they knew the first world was a foreshadowing of the second. And since the first world ended, ended in a universal cataclysm, the second world had to sow in. But it hadn't ended that way, and that's why they believed it would. At least I would condemn that's part of the reason. And so you have these two uh, worlds. But the other thing that I'm pointing out about this is Noah is an Adam figure. 
Don't want to call him a second Adam because Jesus is called second Adam and last Adam. But he's an Adam figure. And therefore, I think that Noah is also a type of Christ since he is given the characteristics so extensively of Adam. And so uh, I, I think this would be an example where a later figure is styled after another figure that's clearly a type of Christ. And here we have um, uh, an example of that. So um, uh, another example would be the case of Joshua and renewing the covenant and leading the people of God into the promised land. Uh, since the uh, original reader would have been justified in interpreting Joshua as a second Moses figure, and since Jesus may also be viewed as a second Moses, it's possible to correlate the significance of Joshua's acts of salvation and conquest of the promised land to the work of Christ. So nowhere does it say explicitly that Joshua is a type of Christ, but it's very clear that Joshua takes the mantle of Moses and that he's a second Moses uh, at the end of Deuteronomy and the beginning of Joshua. And, uh, and so since he's a second Moses, Moses is a clear type of Christ. I think we could consider Joshua a very good uh, candidate for a type. So I hope you're seeing what we're doing here. We're seeing types where the New Testament authors didn't see. Noah is not considered to be a type, for example, in the New Testament. The waters of Noah are, uh, the times of Noah are, but Noah as a figure is not seen as a type of Christ. But I think we can consider him so. Um, even, though, even the waters of Noah in 1 Peter 3 are compared to the waters of baptism. Now, another criteria for typology in the Old Testament. So again, what am I doing? I'm giving you various ways to find types that the New Testament authors or Jesus might not have identified, but that we can legitimately identify. I believe that we should reproduce the interpretive method of Jesus. And the apostles in one aspect of that method is the typological method. People are really fearful of doing it because typology has been so misused um, in the past. So let's look at the, uh, the next criterion. Events of partially fulfilled Old Testament prophecies within the Old Testament itself point to a more complete fulfillment. And I just want to give a simple example of something that we have already looked at, and that is the restoration. We looked at that earlier, remember? In Acts chapter 1, in the background. You'll notice what was to happen when uh, Israel returned from Babylon. That they did return was some kind of a fulfillment because 70 years uh, had occurred and it was prophesied they would return after 70 years. But the majority of that fulfillment did not take place. They did return to the land. But remember, Nehemiah 9 and uh, Ezra 9 were slaves in the land because they're still uh, uh, overruled by hostile foreign powers. And of course, what happens is when they return from the land, there's no resurrection. There was to be such a resurrection at the time of Israel's restoration as there was to be a new creation, a kingdom. Uh, the Messiah was to occur. Did he come when Israel returned from Babylon? Of course not. Uh, the nation streaming into Israel. Did all the nations stream into Israel? Of course not. A new covenant with Israel. Uh, was that take place when they returned? No. Uh, Foreign powers still ruled over them. Um, the spirit was not poured out. Uh, a massive temple was not rebuilt. No definitive forgiveness. However, in just a small sense, in the physical return, Jeremiah's prophecy was partially fulfilled. But the majority of it was not. And so this beginning fulfillment, and what happens? The fulfillment motor seizes up, stops. Motor doesn't get started again until Jesus comes. And he begins to do it in an inaugurated way and will consummate it. And so uh, you have a beginning fulfillment, but that leaves open so much more to be fulfilled later. 
It, uh, and again, I told you today that that's a watershed. Uh, depending on how you understand the restoration prophecies, they either begin fulfillment with Jesus or in a millennium. The dispensationalists take the others. By the way, let me define dispensationalism very simply. Dispensationalism does not believe the church and Israel are the same. Okay? That, that's the essence of it. And that's why that uh, when the church is on the scene, they're not fulfilling the prophecies of Israel. Even for the progressive dispensationalists, which I'm not going to get into what that means, but uh, there's a classical dispensationalist and progressive. Uh, they progressed on a little bit as progressive dispensationalists. And, um, but the, uh, uh, there's got to be, the, the church cannot fulfill the uh, promises of Israel. Why? Because they're not Israel. That's why. Israel's got to come on the, the scene again. The church has got to be taken up. Israel's got to come on the scene again uh, for this to happen. And so um, uh, we were talking today about uh, the church of God. We were talking about uh, uh, the, the illusions and why Jesus sees that the little band of 12 disciples are the beginning fulfillment of Israel's restoration. How they're answering that question uh, positively is at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel. And um, uh, we saw how even the phrase church of God occurs only in one passage in all of the Old Testament, Nehemiah 13.1. And it's a clear allusion. Paul alludes to it 12 times. And uh, what was true about Israel in the Old Testament, uh, that they're the people of God, is just as true today about the church of God and the New Testament. We are the people of God, the continuation of true Israel. And it makes sense, doesn't it? I've already said, Isaiah 49, 3, you're my servant Israel. And if you identify with Jesus as true Israel, we become who he is. Now, so uh, that criteria, events of partially fulfilled Old Testament prophecies within the Old Testament itself point to a more complete fulfillment. And this is true with the um, return from exile. Now, there are also um, candidates for types, maybe those major redemptive historical events that are repeated and are be identified with one another. Here's an example. I'm going to just give two. But you have the um, first exodus, dividing the waters. Then you have the miniature second exodus of the second generation where they cross the Jordan and the waters are divided again. You have Elijah where the waters are, of the Jordan are divided. He's a second Moses figure. It's amazing as a prophet. And then we get the Isaiah prophecies that Israel will have to go through the waters again in the second end time exodus. Uh, as we've seen in Hosea, they're going to come out of Egypt again, intriguingly. And um, so also at the very end of time, the book of Revelation tells us there'll be a final exodus of God's people coming out of the old world. That's a good example. Those probably point to one another. Or we can even take um, the, uh, uh, the temple text. Uh, Eden, I've contended, is a temple. And then you have the temple of Israel with all these decorations of um, their floral de de decorations. Why? Why so much intense floral decorations? I think it's because it's meant to recall uh, the temple in Eden. I think the temple in Eden foreshadowed Israel's temple. Israel's temple foreshadows what Christ comes to do. Tear this temple down, I'll raise it up in three days. His resurrection is the beginning of a new creation, which is uh, a very fertile thing, if I can say it that way. And then Revelation chapter 22 and verses 1 through 2, see a new Eden, which is part also of a temple. It's really weird. Uh, John sees the new heavens and earth as a city in the shape of a holy of holies that is garden-like. It's amazing. In fact, uh, because of that, how could he do that? Because of that problem right there, I wrote a 400-page book called The Temple and the Church's Mission. So, sorry. Uh, when you, I shouldn't say this, um, 
but I will. I never thought I'd say this kind of thing. When you get as old as I am, you, got, you can sometimes, you sometimes have a lot of publications. So, at any rate. So, I'm only 53. Um, no laughing, no laughing. All right. Um, so, uh, so we have these uh, candidates for types in redemptive historical episodes. Now, now, what lies beneath typology? Typology is a philosophy of history. When am I supposed to finish, Hamid? 745, okay. It's a philosophy of history. And undergirding that philosophy of history are five presuppositions. And here they are. Um, there's a parent assumption of corporate solidarity. That is, we talked about the one and the many. What's true of the ones, true of the many. Remember we talked about that? Remember Aiken is an example. We didn't go into depth, but his one act of sin was seen as his family's act of sin. The penalty on him came upon the family. What was true of the head was true of the family members. And, uh, and so in the light of number one, though, uh, because of corporate solidarity, Christ as the Messiah is viewed as representing the true Israel of the Old Testament and true Israel, the church, in the New Testament. I gave some passages undergirding that in my handbook. I give many more passages. And um, in fact, I may have the foot. No, I don't have the footnote. Sorry. Um, so I, I, I have all the biblical texts uh, supporting these presuppositions, one and two. Um, and presupposition number three, history is unified by a wise and sovereign plan so that the earlier parts are designed to correspond and point to the latter parts. So that, that, that really is a philosophy of history. When Christ says, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, God says that in Isaiah 41 and elsewhere. Uh, what does that mean? That Christ and God were present at the beginning of history. They're present at the end of history. And everything in between is guided by them. That's why you get the phrase in Revelation 1, 4, the one who was, is to come, and is. He's guiding history. In fact, beginning and end, first and last, Alpha and Omega. This is what we call... Um, uh, the, the idea of the totality of polarity. You mentioned two total opposites, and it includes everything in between. So, Lord, if I descend into the bottom of the abyss, you're there. If I go to the heaven, you're there. But you're only in those two places. You know where else? No, it's everywhere in between. And so that's the idea. The Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. First and last, Christ is bringing history into being. He's going to conclude it, and he's guiding it all the way along. And we have beautiful passages from, for example, Ecclesiastes. Um, for example, chapter 3, which uh, give us this notion of the polarity of totality. Chapter 3, verse 1, there's an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every, every event under heaven. Time to give birth, a time to die. Time to plant, time to uproot what is planted. Gives all of these opposites. And it says there's an appointed time for everything. God appointed that time for everything. So he can say in verse 11 of, of, of Ecclesiastes 3, he's made everything beautiful in its time. Even though it goes on to say we can't perceive how he has done that. So that's presupposition number three. And, um, and, and we find that um, uh, a number of texts in the New Testament uh, we could deduce further indicating that. Number four, the age of end time fulfillment has come in Christ. And all you have to do is uh, look at the phrase um, latter days in the Old Testament, see the same phrase in the New. In the Old Testament, they're all future, they're prophecies. In the New Testament, 95% of them are already and not yet. They're beginning fulfillment. Some are exclusively about the future, but most are already and not yet. And so the presupposition of the already and not yet. And then fifth, uh, 
As a consequence of the preceding presupposition, it follows that the latter parts of biblical history function as the broader context to interpret the earlier parts because they all have the same ultimate divine author. And that author inspires the various human authors. And one deduction from this is that Christ is the goal toward which the Old Testament pointed and the end time center of redemptive history, which is the key to interpreting the earlier portions of the Old Testament. And so, <clears throat> when we come back again to um, a Luke, Christ says in Luke chapter 24, um, notice again if you have your Bibles, in Luke 24, in verse 27, and beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, what are all the scriptures? Huge debate. Some think all the scriptures are just the messianic prophecies, the direct messianic prophecies. Um, but they can't be just the direct messianic prophecies because we know that that fulfillment formula that's repeatedly used is not just prefixed to direct messianic prophecies. It's also prefixed to event prophecies. Remember Hosea 11.1 1 in Matthew? This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet out of Egypt, I call my son. So you have these, so that we have to now say that types are also what pointed to Christ. And we have seen how we can see a lot of types in various ways in the Old Testament that the New Testament writers did not cite, or Christ did not cite. They could have, but they did not. Um, well, Walter Kaiser uh, is one who says that people who take a Christocentric view who say that all the scriptures means every verse, that they've got to read Christ into every verse. And uh, he criticizes people like Graham Goldsworthy and even and Ian Duguid, uh, the latter who teaches at Westminster. Um, but uh, as we look at this, it's very interesting that we're Scripture and all, there's only two places that occurs, Luke 24, 27, and the well-known text, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scriptures God breathed. It's just some of the Scripture, not all of the Scripture, right? Of course, it's all. This is the only other example where we have all with Scripture. I think it points to uh, Jesus saying that all Scripture uh, is pointing to Christ. Now, that's not always uh, clear. And so, um, I like to give the illustration of how that can be so uh, through the illustration of what I call the Londonocentric uh, plan of Israel, of, of, of um, England's road system. So let's say late 1800s, you want to get to London, but you live in a little hamlet. To get to London, however, you have to go the opposite way of London, but a little path that goes to the next village. You're going the opposite to London. And then uh, you take a larger road. Now you get a little road, enough for one cart, and that goes to a small town. And you're still, you're going uh, not completely opposite, but still somewhat opposite. And then you get to the next town, and there's a wider road. Now you're going horizontal with London. And then you get to the next town, and you're catching the superhighway, if you will. You're going directly to London. Here's the point. To get to London, you had to start out going the opposite way. To get to Christ, you take your passage. Doesn't look like Christ is there. And you start looking at the context. You, st you start traveling. Say, no, nah, this doesn't look like this is going to Christ. You keep going and you keep going until you find a reference to the Messiah, perhaps some typology, etc. Eventually, you're going to find something in that book, by the way, that is going to be either typological or directly prophetic. And um, uh, here's how Graham's Gold, Goldsworthy um, puts it. Um, he says this, 
While some texts may be more peripheral to the main message, no text is totally irrelevant in the Old Testament. Thus, an event, a person, historical narrative of the Old Testament may never be specifically mentioned again, but still it functions contextually within its redemptive historical context and epic, if only to be one of the less prominent events or people in the outworking of God's plan. It will always be part of a larger whole, however, whose significance can be determined. Duguid puts it this way. Um, the central message on every page is Christ. Does, uh, that does not mean every verse by itself contains a hidden allusion to Christ, but that the central thrust of every context leads us in some way to see how that verse is a part of a larger message in its context. And again, I would refer you to uh, my reference to the rabbinic sermon. Uh, a very good rabbinic interpreter, a very good Christian interpreter. You can interpret uh, really with the same skill and apply in the same way. What's the difference? It's not a Christian sermon if in some way we don't try in a legitimate way to see how our passage in some way eventually is leading to Christ and let that organically sort of point in that direction. And not just do a tag on at the end. Uh, here's what the text means. Here's some principles of application. Now let's conclude. Um, and you pray, Lord, I pray that people will trust in Jesus, that he died and rose again. I'm very happy for that prayer, by the way. But that doesn't make the sermon a Christian sermon. It's very important. So Warfield gave this illustration. Let's see if we have it up here. I don't think we have it. Pastor McCott, Abbott Bell. End of slideshow. What happened? I made. Stop, stop. It was way back. Oh, stop. There we go. This is amazing. Raphael compares the Old Testament to a dark room. And in that dark room, you know, when you're in a dark room, you might see the, the kind of furniture it is a little bit can't quite make the patterns of the uh, upholstery out. You can tell maybe there's uh, a wood floor, but you're not sure what kind of wood floor, uh, whether it's oak or whatever. And uh, you can see there's a lampshade and so on. Uh, you can't tell the colors as well. Turn the light on and everything becomes clear. The New Testament is turning the light on. In the Old Testament, it's not that we can't see these things. We can see them but they become clearer in the New Testament when the light of Christ is turned on. So let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you're the light of the world. Pray that you would continue to shine through us as your lamp stands shining to the world. In Christ's name, amen.